Praise the Lord, Refuge Church. It's good to be here with you all this Saturday afternoon. I'm Luke. We're about to kick off this service here in just a sec. We have just a few announcements. Um, if you're a guest here, a visitor, we do have a children's ministry team downstairs. It's safe, secure, all that. We got a great security team. You can go downstairs and check your child in. We'll get them taken care of. Um, as a reminder, so we have our Rock Kids Easter egg hunt next Sunday, Easter Sunday, so you'll remember it. We're looking forward to that. Um, and our awesome children's pastors, uh, brother, uh, brother Rich and Sister Jen, they're still on a quest for those egg nations, that is egg donations. Um, so if you have some, make sure to get them to them because Easter's next Sunday. So if you're, if you're a guy that procrastinates, maybe like me a little bit, then you know, get them in now. Now's your time. Um, Easter Sunday will also be Family Weekend. This is, again, next Sunday. That means all students, kids, impact students, rock children, the whole shebang, everybody's going to be staying upstairs for a great service. Um, with all that being said, we just have a, another quick announcement. We had a Bible quiz tournament yesterday. If all the Bible quizzers will really quickly come up here for just a sec. All right, let's give them a hand. All right. It's great to, uh, to study the Word of God, to have the Word implanted in their hearts. They've memorized so many verses, and you guys always hear about them, but, but our, our church, we just, we just want to let them know that we're so incredibly proud of them. Um, so yeah, just one more time, just give them a hand. All right. And I think uh, you guys can be seated. And I think we have a video that's going to tell us a little bit about that tournament from yesterday. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> All right, and then we do want to thank everybody that had come out to support the quizzers yesterday. It was awesome. It was over at Life Church and in, in, uh, in Lee Summit, Kansas City area. So thank you to everybody who came out to support. It meant a lot to them. All right, with that being said, let's go ahead and I'll stand, and we're just going to get into a time of, of prayer to prepare our hearts and our minds for this service today. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for the opportunity to be here today, Jesus to stand in your presence, Lord, and just to worship you, God. Lord, I'm thankful, God, that we live, God, in a country where it's free, God, where we can just express you, God, in the way that we want to, Jesus. And, and we don't have the fear of being silenced, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God, for everything you've done for us this week, the past week, everything you're doing right now, everything you're going to do in the future, God. Lord, we're just so thankful, God. We have a heart of gratitude, Jesus, for all that you've done, Lord. And Jesus, help us never to forget, Lord, that you are our master, God. And Lord, that we worship you and you alone, God. We submit everything to you today, Jesus. Lord, every thought, every desire, every intention of our heart, we submit it to you today, Jesus. Everything that we have that we're holding on to, God. Lord, we give it to you today, Jesus, because you see it all, Lord. You're in control, Jesus. Lord, I pray that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would be upon every person in this building today, God. Lord, not just on the musicians and the singers, and yes, we need that, God. Not just on the preacher, but upon every member in this congregation, God. I pray that you would speak to us, God. We bind every distraction, whether human or demonic, in the name of Jesus Christ. It is not welcome here in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that your spirit would be loosed in this place, God, to convict us, to talk to us, to change our hearts, God, and our minds, Lord. We pray, God, that angels would be loosed all throughout this building, that those angels would worship with us, that they would be fellow servants of Jesus Christ with us. 
Lord, we adore you, God. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor, Lord. God, right now, I pray that you would create in us clean hearts, oh God. Renew right spirits within us, Jesus. Cast us not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Jesus, because even though we've sinned, God, we've all fallen short of your glory. We thank you for the blood, God. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your spirit, Jesus. And Lord, we come to you today, God, with no condemnation, because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we worship you freely, God, in liberty, Jesus. Lord, in this time of this of grace Jesus we worship you freely God and abundantly Jesus Lord let our praises pour out to you today in this place in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus let's all clap our hands to the Lord this afternoon hallelujah hallelujah give him the shout of praise yes. oh, thank you, Lord. have you come to give him your best praise today I'll say it again have you come to give him your best praise your best worship. God, we want to bring the best that we can to you today. We will stand and rejoice as one people lift in one voice. You're worthy of glory, worthy of honor, worthy of praise.
Thank you, Lord. Let's clap our hands to him today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, I'm so thankful to have an opportunity to worship the Lord today. I'm thankful that we have a house of God to worship the Lord in. He's been so good to us. And you know, sometimes we take for granted that we have a place to come and worship, but throughout history, there's been so many times that the people of God, they didn't have a place to worship. And it didn't necessarily stop the growth of the church, but I'm thankful to be together with so many wonderful people and have an opportunity just to come together and to lift our hands together and to worship together. And part of your giving provides this house of worship that we all come to. And so there's many different reminders of ways that we can give at refuge monetarily. Because what God has given to us, we should give back to him. And this next song that we're going to sing is another reminder of that. Pastor has been preaching a lot on praise. And this song just reminds us that no matter how much of a vocal worshiper you are, God created your voice to give him praise. He created your hands to lift in worship. He created our bodies as an instrument of praise and worship unto him. So let's make sure that we give him the worship that he's due.
Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you've got a lion in sight of the and have a conversation as a praise team about how we don't sing for you all on a Sunday. But I, I remind them to think, imagine if Jesus was standing before you because that's who you're singing for. That's who you're lifting your hands for. That's who you're worshiping. He's the one that we practice for. He's the one we prepare for. He's the one that we bring our best for. And this next song reminds me of the psalmist David because sometimes you bring your worship and it's easy and it's fun and sometimes you bring your worship and it's a sacrifice. But God is always worthy of it regardless of how we feel. And there were so many times throughout scripture where it says that David, he encouraged himself in the Lord. He might be feeling down but he would get out his harp and he would begin to worship. And he would begin to sing songs Sometimes maybe lamentations, sometimes songs of worship, but they were always songs that talked about how great our God was. And no matter what he was facing, that he was determined that he would worship through it because he served the God that was greater than everything. I won't be discouraged even when I'm discouraged I'll remind my soul of all you've done before. I won't be distracted, even in the distraction. I will trust the one 
who's greater than the storm. I will trust the one who's greater than the storm. truth I'm holding the same God who made 
today then don't make me do it right now if you need something from Jesus just raise your hands in the air we just sang about it we don't need more convincing just begin to praise him right now in the spot of the situation the circumstance bring it to him right now whatever it is just raise your hands in the air and just begin to praise him just begin to verbalize that need to him and then praise just verbalize the need and then just begin to praise we don't need convincing, Jesus. We know you can do it, God. Lord, in your name, oh, Jesus. Jesus, in your name, we don't need convincing. We bring you our, our need. We bring you, Lord Jesus, the desires of our heart. We bring you the needs. We bring you the things we're carrying with us. We're struggling with God. And then, Lord, we're going to release those things to you, and we're just going to begin to praise. We're just going to praise God, not because the situation is perfect, but because you're worthy, we know that you know all things and you have all power and authority, Jesus. God wants to do something here today, and that's why He's doing it now. And He's getting ready to do more. He's not done. And if your heart and your mind are open, anything is possible. That's a phrase that sometimes goes in one ear and out the other. So let me say it again. If, if, if your heart and mind are open. If your heart and mind are open, anything's possible. If your heart and mind are not open today, you will leave exactly how you came in. And that's your prerogative. But if your heart and mind are open, anything's possible. God can do it. Praise God. People still sick. Remember to pray for people. Sister Laura Lee, she homesick. And she asked that we pray for her. She's teaching a Bible study, doing, working with a lady. And, her grandson, Missy, I'm sorry, Missy's three-year-old grandson um, broke his leg. And so just keep them in prayer and uh, lots of other ailments and sicknesses still, still kind of circling around. So we pray for those who are not able to be in attendance, but we welcome you online. If you're a guest, we're so thrilled that you're worshiping with us. You don't, you're, you don't have to be a spectator, be a participator. Jump in here. We can, we're, we're thrilled to have you. And... Uh, we have a gift for you, and if you have children, we have gifts for them. And you can fill out a Connect card so we can invite you to a VIP lunch. Had one today with my friend Ryan. Man, it was great to chat with him, hanging out with him. And uh, God's doing great things in his life. And uh, it's cool to sit and talk to someone and see where they are and see what, and kind of get a vision of what God's got planned. And so God is good. Praise God. Um. 
fasting, we, we, we started that last week. If you haven't completed it, we invite you this week to do a three-day fast. If you didn't participate last week, fasting something, that is a sacrifice. That might be water only for some of you. Others, it might be something else, uh, something, maybe not an entire diet, um, but it should be a sacrifice, and we invite you to participate simply because, wow, as a body of Christ, if we all were to fast and pray with one mind and one purpose at the same time, I tell you, we get, we get the intention of heaven, prayer, fasting, worship. These are spiritual disciplines we want to participate in. And so we are thankful that you're willing to do so. We're going to dismiss Rock Church and Bridge at this time. Next week they'll be staying up, or they'll be staying down the whole service for Easter. I know that's already been mentioned, but just a reminder because next week's Easter. <clears throat> you know, there's a kind of a medley of some old hymns that I was thinking about as I prepared this message, and some of these words are just so simple, but they're so powerful and there, there some of the verses only have 10 total different words and then the chorus simply repeats the, the same lines over and over again but in all its simplicity if you think about the truth and the personal meaning attached to these songs they are just so powerful oh.
if you're not, don't. But if you're thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ, let out a thunderous round of applause so that all of heaven can hear that there is a church that is thankful for the blood of Jesus. This afternoon, I want to talk to you about possibly the greatest topic I can ever stand in a pulpit and talk to you about. And my title is, Oh, Oh, the Blood of Jesus. Oh, the Blood of Jesus. Sometimes the sight of blood, if you get sick, I'm sorry. But this is a beautiful sight of blood. Because the blood of Jesus changed eternity. And this Friday is a special day. It's Good Friday. I know today's Palm Sunday, but it's Good Friday. The day we remember that our Lord Jesus took on flesh as our Savior, dwelt among us, went to a cross and paid a price that really don't... I know the terminology, it gets thrown around if you've been around church circles for a while. Oh, he played a price we were supposed to pay. No, no, no. Think about that. He paid a price, you and me. We were supposed to pay ourselves. And he did more than just get beat up, whipped, nails in his hands, his feet, a spear to his side. Throughout the process, he poured out blood. If this would have happened to any of us, our blood would have also been poured out. If you'd have been beaten, whipped, and pierced on your side and hung on a cross, any of us would have poured out blood. It would have been the exact same process, but it wasn't just any spilling of blood that was significant. It was his blood that changed everything. My blood, your blood, it might have been tragic and horrible and violent, whatever, but his blood changed everything. Why is that? We read about that in 1 Peter 1. It says, for as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot, without blemish or without spot. The word of God declares four irrefutable truths regarding the availability of really personal salvation. Number one, every believer has been purchased or redeemed at a cost. Number two, the price of redemption was exorbitant. Number three, the purchase price was paid with blood. And number four, the blood was not just any blood. It was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And his blood was the currency from which he purchased us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Paul writes to the Corinthian church and says, Don't you realize your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit was living, who lives in you and was given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself. For God bought you. We don't like that language today. I want independence. I'm in control of myself. He says, you don't belong to yourself. God bought you. Bought you with a high price. So we must honor God with our bodies. According to scripture, the necessity of shed blood was determined from the foundation of the world. It was an irrevocable biblical fact that shedding of blood was a prere prerequisite for forgiveness. Hebrews 9.22 tells us almost all things by the law are purged, and without, or purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood... There is no remission. If he doesn't shed his blood, there's no repentance, no remission, no cancellation, no removal. There, there's no eternity for us without the shed blood. To understand this mandatory requirement, one must have a mental grasp on the reasons for such a drastic criterion. And the, and the root problem is this. It's, it's sin. Sin. 
Romans 6, 3 tells us the penalty for sin is death. Romans 6 also tells us the wages of sin are death. It says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every one of us here have sinned. Sin is a root cause of the problem, and we're all supposed to die. There's not eternity. There's no chance because of sin. But Jesus Christ stepped in. And the reason for this precept, you might know, and some of you might be like, oh, yeah, ho-hum, we're talking about the blood and Jesus and Easter time and the cross. I've heard this a million times. But I want you to understand, maybe you know about what, and it's the blood. But maybe you don't know why. Why blood? Why? Why is the blood a necessity? The reason for this was given by Moses way back in Leviticus 17 when he said, For the life of the body is in its blood. I have, I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life that makes purification possible. So in that, leave that up there and take a look at that because that is a beautiful scripture. In the Old Testament, they had to kill an animal and they had to put blood because if they didn't, it was, hey, that was a scapegoat. That was a blood, that, that was a sacrificial lamb that was supposed to go ahead and pay a price that you were supposed to pay. But the problem is the lamb didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a sinless lamb that took away the sin of the world. It just would push things back another year until they could kill another animal, put the animal sacrifice there, and then, and then the blood would be shed again but what he gives to Moses here is that blood it's given in exchange for a life and that blood makes purification possible but what that was was setting us up in the Old Testament for what was coming in the New Testament and in the New Testament John the Baptist the first time he sees Jesus goes hey behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world they knew exactly what th that he was saying they wanted to kill him Jesus and every other person because he was stating that Jesus Christ was the Old Testament Jehovah God it was not a father son spirit relationship they were he was saying that is the God of the Old Testament and when he came on the scene, he said, there's the lamb that we've all been hoping for. Not a lamb that's going to push something back or just cover something, but that's the lamb that will take away the world's sins one time and forever. And so spiritually, without the shedding of blood, there's none of the following. There's no purification. There's no cleansing. There's no atonement. There's no remission. There's no removal. There's no cancellation. My blood or your blood, it would have never done that. It would have never taken care of whatever needed to be taken care of. It would have been a tragedy, but it would not have provided remission, and no animal could do it either. The blood of Jesus is the only blood that permanently atones for sin. Hebrews 10 verse 1 says, the old system the one that I was just referring to about animal sacrifice under the law of Moses. It was only a shadow. They, they call it a, a type and shadow or a foreshadowing of it or typology, a, a dim preview of the good things to come. Not only, not the good things themselves, the sacrifices under that system, I just said this, were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide the cleansing for those who came to worship. Could you imagine... All of our sins at one time of year, we sacrifice an animal and pour the blood out and go, man, that'll carry us through to next year. I'll see you next year. And we'll do this again. Or we would get together weekly and say, oh, I can't wait. Oh, atonement's going to be coming here. And one day we're going we're to be looking forward to it. We're, we're, we're eight months away. We're seven months away. We're six months away until that animal could be killed and blood could be shed and push our sins back just one more year. But yet they're always hovering. Could you imagine having to carry your sins and mistakes with you, always hovering over your life till they could just get pushed back another year? Some of you can because you do that. Because you carry your stuff with you, and, you, and sometimes it's hard. It's, God can forgive us, but it's hard to forgive ourselves at times, right? It's as if they could have provided perfect cleansing. The sacrifices would have stopped for the worshipers, would have been purified once and for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. Why? Because we as humans were given a conscience. And when we fail, there's, there's guilt involved with that. There's guilt involved with, I didn't meet the mark that 
I should have met. And so he's saying, hey, that animal, the guilt could have been removed if that was the case. He said, but, but instead, those sacrifices, actually, they actually reminded of them of their sins. It wasn't just a forgiving. It was saying that, that Old Testament way, could you imagine? Hey, next year we got to do this again. Why? Because four years ago, five years ago, eight years ago, 12 years ago, 13, 15, 18, 24, there, there were sins that we just got to keep rolling back. And so on. instead of forgiving me of my sins, it was actually a constant reminder of the fact I needed something to push it back another year. And he says, for it's not possible with the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The Old Testament sacrifice, they couldn't do that at the end of the year. That they, they, he couldn't do it. It couldn't remove or expunge them. No. But Jesus said, I got a plan coming. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10 says in verse 5, that is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings. You've given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or offerings of sin. Verse 10 says, for God's will for us was to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day offering the same sacrifice sacrifices again and again, but those sacrifices could not take away sin. But our high priest, who is that? Jesus, offered himself to God as a single, one-time, single sacrifice for sins, good for all of time. So that means that whatever sins that I'm going to be preaching about in 2026 have already been taken care of. In 2025, they've already been taken care of. In December of 2024, they've already been taken care of. In, in, in sins of last week, they've been taken care of. The sins when you were 14 have been taken care of. The sins when you were 34 have been taken care of. The sins when you were 54 have been taken care of. The sins when you were five years old have been taken care of. And so we have to remember this, that, whoa, whoa, hold on a second here. I don't need to be reminded of my sin from an animal that needs to have its blood shed every time. I can go, I have a God who loved me so very much that he said, ain't no way they're going to pay their own price. I will go ahead and take on flesh and I will shed the blood. But the difference between me and that animal is I'll go ahead and take care of it once and for all that they will never have to remember it or hear about it again. And so he offered himself and sat down in a place of honor at God's right hand. Verse 17 says, I will never again what does that say? We serve a God who says, I will never again remember their sins. Now, I know I'm in a place of really, really holy people that don't do a lot of things wrong. So maybe that doesn't excite you. That, for me, thrills me because I am not always holy. I've not always been on my A game. I've tripped up, messed up, made mistakes, more, made poor choices. So when I read a verse that says, hold on a second, you're aware of my sins, and I don't have to hide them. I don't have to be guilty for them. I don't have to feel condemnation from them. You're telling me that when you paid a price, Jesus, that when you shed your blood, that you're saying, I will not remember your sins, that thrills me. And that makes me want to sing, oh, the blood of Jesus. And when sins have been forgiven, there's no need to offer any more sacrifices because this book of Hebrews was written to people who were thinking about going back into animal sacrifices. Jesus had died and ascended into heaven, and they were thinking, hey, we should probably start practicing the law again. Maybe that guilt was arising or saying, man, you know, old habits die hard. I think we should start killing animals and offering their blood again. And, 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 and the writer of Hebrews goes, hold on a second here. I want to remind you, when sins have been forgiven, you don't ever need to offer any other sacrifice ever again because one sacrifice, one time, took 
took care of all the sins of humanity from the Old Testament to the New Testament to the 21st century to the babies you haven't even had yet. God took on flesh and dwelt among us and paid a price and said, you don't ever have to pay a price. I'm raising children who I've been dead. They, they've sinned. And I teach them about the beauty of forgiveness and repentance. But I think about grandchildren that aren't even here. And I pray they ain't going to be here for a long time. But I think about the fact that, you know what? That, 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 that shed blood paid a price for grandkids that aren't even alive yet. I thank God and say, oh, the blood of Jesus. I'm going to keep singing that because I'm thrilled about this truth. And so he says, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly. I don't know about you. But I don't always walk into the presence of Jesus and go, oh, I'm here again. There's times where your humanity might go, should you come back to church? Should you come to an altar? You've already been there for that 12 times. Certainly, your God could not forgive you again for the same thing. So you might as well not approach the altar. You might as well not even come to church. You ain't never going to change. That's the devil. He's the, he, he's the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that, if you ever need somebody to accuse you of something, he's going to be right there. You might have some friends like that too. They ain't your friends then. I won't accuse you. Oh, you did this. You did that. And so, I, 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 why? I shouldn't even do this. Why do I even try? I shouldn't even, I, it's not even worth it. But he says, let me remind you, you can come boldly. You ain't coming boldly because you've, you've gone three weeks without sin and you deserve it. There is not a single soul in this room or watching online, either live or archived. There ain't not a single person. I don't care how good you think you are. I certainly, as the preacher who's holding this microphone, standing in this pulpit, I would never be naive enough to go, well, you know what? I've done a lot for God. And I've been working here for like 15 years. I probably earned a, a visit. I could live the rest of my life perfect and still not be worthy. But my worth to boldly enter that throne room has nothing to do with my qualifications. It has everything to do with, are you covered in the blood? The blood was shed, but has it been applied? Are you covered? Is there a covering of that blood of Jesus Christ? Because when he looks and he sees the blood, he says, oh, no, no, no. You're welcome. Come on in here. Come on. And sometimes we go, God, I did it again. God, I don't deserve to be here. Oh, God, can you still love me? And he's like, have you read my word? Oh, God, but you don't understand. You ever tell God he don't understand? <laughs> sometimes we say those things. Oh, God, you don't understand. I'm just wondering if he's like, hey, angels, y'all listen to this. This is hilarious. They don't think I understand. He says, no, 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 let me remind you. You can come boldly. Boldly. Old Testament, oh, no. You couldn't come boldly. You had to come with, not without sacrifice. The blood had to be shed. You had to work through, you had to work through the, the process, and the process still points to the New Testament, that repentance, that water baptism, the way that that Old Testament tabernacle was set up in the New Testament plan of salvation. But I don't need to kill an animal, but I do need to repent. I don't need to wash at a brazen labor, but I do need to be baptized in his name. Oh, I can, I can enter into a holy place. And I, as, I, as I make this journey, I get closer and closer. And then he says, I'm going to put my spirit inside you. It's not going to be just a spirit that dwells between the wings of the cherubim that you can commune with. I actually am going to put my spirit in your heart. And let me remind you, he says, you can come boldly and enter heaven's most holy place. Why? By the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. 
it made a way for me to enter the holiest of holies. It made a way for me to come boldly before God's throne when I don't deserve it. I don't have to pull out a resume and say, hey, well, here's my qualifications. I've been a pastor for 15 years. I was filled with the Holy Ghost as a, as a six-year-old. And, and, you know, I was raised in church. And Jesus, I, I, I have never been drunk. So I, 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 I have qualifications. No, my qualifications stink. My, my, I have nothing to offer. But all... I can, I can offer is, is my, my hands, my raised hands, like we just sang about today. But when I can come into the holiest of holies, and the reason I have qualifications to do so, the reason why I'm justified is based on that beautiful blood of Jesus Christ that he shed with me in mind. Blood is so important, you know. And he says, since we have a, a great high priest who rules God's house, he says, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him for our guilty consciences. Oh, there it is again. Why? Because in humanity, when we mess up, there's guilt. There's guilt and there's things that we carry. And, and from what I read, he's telling us to bring those guilty consciences. They've been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. What could he possibly be talking about there in the New Testament? I have an idea. There it is. Washed in water. There it is right there. If you've never been washed in water, that water city tap ain't nothing magical, nothing holy about it. But what makes it holy is when you enter it with a good conscience saying, oh, God, I'm going to bring you my guilt. I'm going to bring you my sin. I'm going to bring you my shame. And you told me to enter boldly, so all I'm going to do here is, like it says, to do so in faith. I'm going to step in that water in faith, put my faith in you that what you said is true. And so I don't have any qualifications. I don't have anything to go by. I don't say I deserve this. I earned this. I, I, all I know is I'm going to step in that water. I'm going to repent of my sins. I'm going to step in there have the waters wash away the, wa the, 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 the sins. I'm going to have, I'm going to take on the name of Jesus. He says, let us go. And, and blood, it's so important to God that it's mentioned in the Bible about 700 times. David referred to the incorruptible blood. Peter spoke of the precious blood. John wrote about the overcoming power of the blood. And we're told in Leviticus 17, 11, that life of the flesh is in the blood. This is true both in physical and spiritual realms. Your natural blood supplies life-giving oxygen and nutrients to every cell in your body. I had a couple things going on in my, in my body, and so I had blood work done. And to, on Tuesday morning, I'm going back to a doctor to find out what my blood is speaking. Our blood work tells the story of what's going on inside of us in every way, shape, and form. If the blood, if the flow of blood were to be cut off from an area of your body, that part of your body would begin to die. Spiritually speaking, any part of your life that is cut off from the blood of Christ is now dying. It's now, the, it's now having life, giving nutrients brought to it. His blood needs to flow and cover every single part of our entire being. God, and people will say, plead the blood. That phrase isn't in the Bible, but the concept is there. Lord, I want the blood to cover my mind. I want the blood to cover my eyes. I want the blood to be a door on my lips. I want the blood to cover my ears. I want the blood to cover my heart. I want the blood to cover my hands. I want your blood that you shed on Calvary to wash every aspect of my body because I want to be a man that walks in your way. Spiritually, without the blood, my life would be filth. It would be filled with filth, but thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. Why? Because without the blood, what are we? All we are is sinners destined to hell. God also equipped your body with white blood cells that fight off sickness. Anytime bacteria or viruses try to get in your white cells, start destroying the invaders. When your natural body's healthy, you're protected from disease. And when you are spiritually healthy, there is not anything that the devil can bring against you that the blood of Jesus cannot overcome. Truly, there's life in the blood. There's, there's life in the blood. I thank God today for the precious blood of Jesus. The word precious denotes that it's of limited quantity. 
An illustration of that definition might be gold. It's considered a precious metal. It's in part because there might be a limited quantity available. In fact, it's estimated that if all the gold that had ever been mined were heaped in one pile, it would only be one-third as tall as the Washington Monument. It's a precious metal. Jesus, as a human adult, had probably five quarts of blood. The limited quantity is one of the reasons his blood is so precious. But the good news is that limited quantity was sufficient as a remedy of sin. You might say, five quarts ain't going to do it for me. If you knew my story, you got five gallons, then I maybe can sneak by. But what you need to understand is one drop of the blood of Jesus, just one drop, just one drop in your life was enough to cover every sin, every poor choice, every mistake, every error, Everything that you have ever done, one drop, is enough to cover. His blood was not only pure, it remains forever pure. The blood of Christ has flowed over many filthy souls, including mine. Think of all the evil, all the perversion, all the wickedness that might be in your life or in your bloodline or in somebody you know, or think about stories through, through the ages, humanity, think about dictators, vile, evil people. Yes, his blood was shed for them. Doesn't mean that everybody is always going to, he he uh, to heaven because the blood needed to be replied and there's a plan for salvation. But he paid the price. If we will follow his plan, we can be saved. The blood will never lose it's power. I feel like I heard that song too. The blood will never lose its power. It's been said that one arm of Christ on the cross was outstretched to cover Old Testament believers all the way back to Adam. And another was extended to cover all New Testament believers all the way to us and those even not yet born. The one death of Jesus Christ covered all the New Testament sins and all the Old Testament sins. And his blood still has the power to cover whatever needs to be covered on this Sunday in March. For whatever you brought in, whatever you're living in, whatever you're trying to forget, whatever you're trying to ignore, whatever you're trying to hide. That's why I say if your heart and mind are open. God can do something today. But if you prefer to try to navigate your path of guilt and condemnation and sin, he will say, feel free to try. But all it's going to be doing is, a, is it's just going to be a never-ending cycle until we can say, wait, why am I carrying this when you already shed blood for this? Why am I continuing to try to fight this and do this on my own when you already love me enough to hang on a cross and go, hold up, there's going to be somebody living in the first century that needs their sins washed away. Hold up, there's going to be somebody living in the 12th century that needs their sins washed away. Hold up, there's going to be somebody in the 19th century that needs their sins. Oh, hang on a second. There's going to be somebody living in March 2024 in Liberty, Missouri that needs their sins washed away. And so I'm going to hang on this cross and my blood is going to be poured out. Why? Not for some religious story, but for a story of love, for a story of a Savior that was, was intimately involved with and interested in his creation. And because of what he did, he's given us one of the most beautiful and amazing gifts that we could ever dream of when we read in Hebrews 8.12. And he says, I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again Remember their sins. Can you think about that? Think back over your most recent sins. Go ahead, think about it. Did it happen 30 minutes before church? Did it happen yesterday, a week ago, a month ago? Are you a really great person and you can't remember any? Well, then you can begin to go, Lord, forgive me of my pride. Yeah. 
I don't want to be like the Pharisees. Lord, God, I thank you that I'm not like her. Because he looks at the heart and goes, what she's offering me is so much more beautiful than what you're offering me. He says, I want you to know something. I'll not only forgive your wickedness, I won't even remember your sins. We can't wrap our brains around that because we're finite individuals. And when somebody wrongs us, they might say, I'm so sorry. And you go, that's fine. I forgive you. But in your head, you're going, oh, if you let that happen again. I'm going to try, try and forgive you. But in my brain, I might be going, mm, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice. Ooh. And, but if you've repented for those sins, you think about this. In some strange way for that moment, it's almost like you know more than God. At one moment, you know more than God. What do you mean by that? Because you remember something he doesn't. Oh, but God, I can't go to that altar again. I know I've repented about the same thing, and I just can't do it again because you know what I've done. No, no, I don't. No, I, I don't. Because Scripture says as far as the east is from the west. Because then north and south, you know, you go north, you go north long enough, you're going to start going south. South long enough, you're going to start going north. Unless you believe the earth is flat, in which case, God bless you. <laughs> Scripture does say upon the sphere of the earth, but yeah, I know there's arguments to that too, but that's another message. But if I go east long enough, I don't, I don't know, nothing changes. It's, it's infinite. I can just keep going east. I can just keep going west. Whatever. He purposely, he didn't say as far as the north is from the south, because there's a starting and ending point. He says, when I forgive you, your sins are as far as the east is from the west. He was intentionally using language. As far as the east is from the west, meaning that thing's gone. It's gone in infinity. And when you start to try to, to tell God, yeah, but, man, back in 1996. No, but God, you know what I did in 2016. Actually, no, no, you repented of that. I'm not sure what you're talking about. We can't fathom that because we don't operate that way. But the God of all eternity looked through the sands of time and said, I'm going to take on flesh. That was always his plan. I'm going to take on flesh. And this is the kind of stuff, if, if this doesn't excite you, I got nothing better than this. This, maybe I don't deliver it perfect, but this right here, probably the best message I can ever give you. Because without this, oh, but you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. There is no Holy Ghost without the blood. Oh, but you can be washed in the, the water today. Ah, there is no water without the blood. Oh, well, let me tell you about a place called heaven. It's eternity. There will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness. Ain't happening without the blood. Oh, but God can give you strength from on high. There will be signs, wonders, and miracles. Not happening. Because death, hell, and the grave are not defeated without the blood. Everything hinges upon the blood. And then when he says, I love you enough to take on flesh and shed this blood. And not only, he didn't even have a guarantee. He doesn't even, I mean, like, we think it's crazy. Jesus died for Adolf Hitler. Adolf didn't respond. He didn't apply the blood. 
And so that evil, vile wickedness was sin, and he never responded. He died for you, but the blood has to be applied. The blood has to be received. It has to be accepted. And he sits here and goes, when I shed blood, I'm not only forgiving you, I'm, I'm, I'm not even remembering what you've done. I read that, and I'm like, why? Why? I can't. I've got nothing fit for a king. All that I can do is just raise my hands, and I can, and I can sing hallelujah, and I can sing, oh, the blood of Jesus. It's such a simple song. Let's move on to something more exciting. You know, sometimes I think we just need to sing three lines, oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes white as snow. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood that will never lose its power. Jesus, please help us to not ever get to hear so many messages on the blood to not grow up where the Ark of the Covenant's in our living room and we forget. Lord God, like we read about in the Old Testament, help us as Pentecostal believers. Help us, Lord. I don't care if it's somebody's first time here. They've been born and raised in this church, God. Help us right now to never take the blood for granted. Help us, Jesus, that even though we might have read about it a million times and heard a million messages on it, God, let us never take it. Help me, Lord. I preached about it. Lord, let me never take it for granted. God, the blood, the blood that you shed, Jesus, the blood that you poured out on Calvary, Jesus, the blood that we remember and we talk about, Lord. We take communion and we celebrate at Easter time and Resurrection Sunday and Good Friday. God, help us as a church right now. We've heard it so many times. Help us guard our hearts right now that we still, Lord, can think about the blood that was shed. That it still just makes us just want to raise our hands, sing a song, repent of sins, respond to you, to lift you up, Lord. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. There's not a moment that we can ever do anything that makes us qualified to come into your presence. But because of the blood, you said, come boldly, you're covered. God, help us. The blood of Jesus is quite literally the flag that flies over the territory that's owned by the Savior. He paid a price for our sins. We're not our own. As I read, we're bought and paid for. His blood applied establishes an enforceable, an enforceable boundary line that Satan has no choice but to respect. When that death angel came in the Old Testament, and, I'm, and he, remember this because the blood was shed in the Old Testament, but the blood had to be applied in the, in, the, in the tabernacle. The blood had to be shed, and then they had to bring that blood, and the animal was on the, on the, on the altar, and then they had to, the high priest had to carry that blood and pour it on a mercy seat of that Old Testament tabernacle. And if you're here going, I have no clue what you're talking about, then see me because we've got to get you in a Bible study because you're going to learn things in a Bible study that will change your life. But they, they would have to bring that blood and pour it on a mercy seat. Blood had to be moved and applied. And so in the, in the Old Testament, when, when they were in, in Egypt, and God says, I'm getting ready to deliver you after 430 years of bondage. But first, I'm going to take the firstborn throughout the land of Egypt. And I believe he was going to take their firstborn too. But first, he says, I'm going to give you a plan. And there's going to be blood that shed. But the blood didn't only have to be sh to shed. Because if, if the blood was shed and it wasn't applied, they still would have died. But he says, if you don't want to lose your firstborn in Egypt, he says, you're going to kill an animal, but then you're going to take that blood and you're going to apply it to your doorpost of your home. And then he says, don't go out until the morning, which means this, blood was shed, blood had to be applied, and then they had to stay in the covering of the blood. And by staying in that covering of the blood, when the death angel came into the streets of Egypt, even the death angel, the enemy itself, had to stop. And when it was looking for someone to take, someone to destroy, 
They didn't look at the person. They didn't know that the, the death angel didn't look at their name, their qualifications, their, their job employment, their, their history, their friends. It, it only looked at one thing, the blood. <laughs> the death angel would go through the streets, and it was looking for somebody to claim. And it said, oh, that's a house I can't touch. Because blood wasn't just shed, blood was applied. And so there was a blood covering. But if somebody chose to say, this is foolishness, I'm not doing this. I'm going to kick a soccer ball out in the street. They would have died. Because the blood protection, you had to stay within the covering of the blood. Hear me, God's come back soon. Yeah. Now is not the time to leave the church. Now is not the time to leave the covering of the blood. Now is not the time to walk away from the protection of the blood. Now is not the time to go play in the street when the death angel's looking for somebody to claim. We're getting ready to be freed for eternity. Not just 430 years of bondage, but we're getting ready to be freed forever and ever and ever. Now is not the time to take the kids and play in the street. Now is the time to go, I got to stay within the covering, the confines. Confines, I don't like that word. It seems restricted. Restricting. You can view it how you want. When he gives me a plan and invites me to be a part of that plan and says, don't go play in the street, but stay in the covering of the blood, that's not confining. That is a beautiful reward from God that he would say, here's my plan. I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you what happens if you follow it. I'm going to tell you what happens if you don't. I am going to take that blood and I'm going to apply that blood to my home. I want when the death angel goes looking for my family that they're saying, I can't touch that home because it's covered in the blood. Because it's covered in the blood. But back then it was just the blood of an animal. Today it's the blood of Calvary. And instead of an animal and taking something and applying to a doorpost, he says, my blood's been shed. Here's how you can apply it. You can go down in the waters of baptism, repent of your sins. That's that Old Testament altar. And then you can go down in the waters of baptism and take that and apply that blood to your life. If the blood's been shed and you say, cool, Jesus died for me. That sounds like a neat, a neat story. How do you make that personal? You take that and say, God, forgive me of my sins, and now I want to have those sins washed away. I want to have that washed clean. I want to apply the blood that you shed to my life, and when I do, I want somebody to say this when they baptize me. I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission for the removal, the cancellation. That's what happens. Every sin, mistake, poor choice, foolish decision, it washes away in the water and you can come up and say, yeah, but God, the sins that I committed last year. And he's going, what? What are you talking about? All I see is a person covered in the blood that I shed. All I see is a person who has taken on my name in the waters of baptism. That's what I see in the Bible. Bible tells us about these weapons to overcome the, the devil. In Revelation 12, 10 and 11, he says, I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It's come at last. Salvation and power in the kingdom of our God in the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who is the devil, has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they have defeated him. How? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Hear me as I wrap up this service today. You're sitting on a testimony that you think you can't share. You're sitting on something that you're going, oh, I messed up. This is the way I live. I don't want nobody to know. They'll lose respect. They won't want to be my friend. They won't have respect for me because they'll know what I've done and where I've been. He's saying that there's a devil that's standing before God going, "You, oh, Zach is this and Dylan's this and Abigail's this and Luke is this and Ron Ryan's this, and Sakura's this, and he's trying to accuse all of us of all of our wrongs. And Jesus is going, don't you dare talk about my children. They have been washed in the blood. They have taken on my name. And the way you overcome is the fact that the blood has been shed, but also by the word of your testimony. When you've been washed in the blood, when you've repented of those sins, don't sit on that testimony. One of the 
ways that you overcome is get up on the house tops and go, can I tell you, I used to be a drug addict. I used to be someone who was violent. I used to be someone who did, was not honest. I used to be this person. I used to be a person who wasn't faithful. I used to be this person, but I've been washed. I've been cleansed. I've been justified and sanctified, not by anything that I've done, but by the precious, beautiful blood of Jesus Christ. And by the word of your testimony, you can be delivered. You can deliver others. Other people can feel hope. Hope is a powerful medicine. You know what? And you can stand to your feet. I'm just about done. But Satan, he's always tried to take God's things and twist God's things. Holy Spirit, false spirit, truth versus lies, prophets versus false prophets, Messiah versus Antichrist. We always we even see he was he was the one in charge of music. He's trying to pervert music. Everything that's God's, he tries to twist it. But hear me when I say the one weapon that Satan has no counterfeit for. There's nothing that he, he can counterfeit music. He can counterfeit false prophets. He can counterfeit worship. He can counterfeit all this and the what he cannot counterfeit. He cannot counterfeit the blood of Jesus Christ. And so the blood, it covers. And even his demons, even his death angels have to walk and go, ah, I can't touch that house. I can't touch that family. I can't touch that individual. Because if you stay in the covering of the blood, the only way he can touch you is when you leave the covering of the blood and say, I can do this alone. I don't need to be in the covering. But when you're under the covering, he can't, he can't mimic that. He looks and says, I can't touch him. I can't do anything. Because the devil, he doesn't have blood. He doesn't have blood. But God is a spirit, and he also took on humanity. He's the only one that walked in, in a spirit being and as a human being. And it says in Acts 20, 28, God purchased us with his own blood. That shows. It didn't say even Jesus. It says God. That's because God and Jesus are the same. It's not a co-equal, co-eternal being. But the blood, it can't be mimicked. Satan's just a fallen angel. Angels don't have blood. But the powerful blood of Jesus is a weapon without counter defense. It can't be mimicked. He shed that blood to give you hope. But hope is where this all starts. Hope, hope is the essence. And that's why it's the, it's the vision of this church. Because guess what? When you get up, when you caught up in sin, that could be, that could be substances, sexual sin, it don't matter. Lying, violence, people get caught up in sin. When you get caught up in sin, you start to feel like, I'm stuck, I'm in an abyss, I can't see, I can't, I can't, I don't even know where to go from here. And then people, they'll even start to turn to suicide because they'll go, I, 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 I can't go anywhere else, this is it, it's the end of the road, it, it doesn't get any better than this. And Jesus is trying to preach a message to somebody going, you're never hopeless. As long as he's a part of the story, he can lift you out of the pit. He can set you free. He can deliver you. He can give you hope and purpose. And so rem remember this. Tomorrow doesn't have to be yesterday such a simple phrase but that's powerful tomorrow doesn't have to be yesterday you can go when Jesus called people he never said hey uh, I only have 15 minutes with you Peter John's coming in for his interview at 1230 Bartholomew shows up at 1 I just finished Andrews. I have my questions for this interview. Tell me about your greatest strengths. Stupid questions. Tell me about your greatest weaknesses. Have you provided me with three references, professional references? One can be personal. Tell me about your work history. Jesus just looked at him and he's like, oh yeah, you're, you're, a, you're a zealot. You want to kill people and take over things with force? You're a good fit. Will you follow me? 
Others might be going, dude, are you going to ask him if he's going to take a sword? Is he going to kill people? Can I even trust this guy when I sleep? Will you follow me? Come on. Hey, you're a tax collector. Everybody hates you. I think you'll be a good fit. Will you follow me? You're a fisherman. Nobody here respects you. Will you follow me? And the people that he picks, it's like, even Jesus himself, when they're, they're like, Jesus, what? He came from where? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And he just went around and started picking people. And I never read. I never read about him going, now are you going to steal again? Did, did Jesus know Judas was going to mess up? But he still chose him. That's my boy. Because he, he never once. Are you going to steal? You're not going to kill anybody, are you? I know you're a zealot. I got to make sure that you're going to be who you say you are. He just looks at him and he goes, I'm not here to talk about anything that happened prior to this moment. I'm here to talk about right now. And right now, I have a question for you. Will you follow me? And here we are thousands of years later, and he's asking you the same question. He's asking you right now. Hey, what happened last week, last month, last year? You could be the coldest person, the person that feels like, I'm so far gone. Ain't nobody here has any hope for me. You don't know what I've done. Listen, I look at you, and I see every single one of your faces. I look in your eyes, and I see somebody who's a world changer. I see somebody who's got a testimony, who's powerful. Every one of you. Because you know what? Right now, as I'm preaching, I am not Jesus. But I am feeling right now what Jesus feels. And he's looking at people right now. And I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the eyes of Jesus in my eyeballs right now. And he's looking at you and going, I don't care what's happened yesterday, what happened last year. I don't care. Here's my question. Will you follow me? Will we begin to write a new story right now? I am not asking about anything that's happened prior to this moment. What is your story? Your tomorrow doesn't have to be your yesterday. What I want to know is right now, right now, will you come to this altar? Will you repent of your sins? Will you have your sins washed away in the waters of baptism? Will you begin to be faithful? Will you just begin to worship me? Will you trust me? Will you walk with me? Will you stop trying to figure everything out about how I'm going to go from right here to right there and just say, they, they, they started to say, well, should we take clothes and should we take money? He goes, leave it all at home. Trust me. I'm going to teach you some things along this journey. Well, I, I, I'm not used to that. I was, and when I was fishing, I did this. And when I was a zealot, I did this. And when I was a tax collector, I did this. No, no, no. We're not taking clothes with us. We're not taking money with us. We're not taking food with us because I'm going to show you something on this journey. If you leave behind what's been everything in your life prior and if you'll walk with me, I'm going to show you some things. I can take your life and I can do something. You're going to overcome some things by my blood and by the word of your testimony. And so if you will walk away from the life that you've known and stop asking how and how's it going to work and, and what's going to happen next and, and, and I just need a plan and I just need some details. He's going, I'm not giving you any of that. What I'm asking you is I'm not going to ask about anything prior to this moment, but I'm asking you, will you give me your life from this moment? Will you follow me from here? Will you walk with me? Will you trust me? I, if, if you will, if you will, I'm going to use you to change the world. If you will, your life is going to be a testimony. If you will, you're going to be mighty. You're going to be anointed. But I need you right now to make a decision. I need you right now. I'm not asking about anything prior to this moment. But will you give me today? Will you give me tomorrow? Hold that blood. That blood that he shed made this possible. That blood that he shed made me be able to come boldly in his throne room right now. That blood that he shed didn't make me a prisoner to my past. That blood that he shed gave me a future.
Thank you for joining us today. We know that you have so many online options, and so we're really grateful that you chose to be with Refuge Church today. And we want you to know that moving forward, we have weekly options for you to continue to tune in online. All times are Central Standard Time, but Wednesday evenings, we have 7 p.m., and Sunday afternoons, we have 2 p.m., and we're going to actually stay in that afternoon slot while we construct a new building. So we will be at that 2 p.m. slot for the next couple of years as we're sharing space with a church who has recently purchased our existing building. So we just pray that you will continue to tune in and view our services and worship with us online.